Um, it was interesting that Tom said uh, that we could think of all kinds of examples of reasons why the center would be useful. I thought about starting my remarks that way and thinking about where we are in technology as a moral crisis or just a crisis. Um, I thought about listing examples of horrible things that have happened as a result of technology, which I think would be, um, would be attention getting, but I decided instead to just think of one thing that's horrible that's happening with technology that's happening here and how I feel about it. Um, the thing I'd like to talk to you about is a project, uh, a, an initiative in Detroit called Project Greenlight. I don't know how many people have heard of Project Greenlight before. Um, you know, surprisingly not that many. I'd say maybe 10% of the people raised their hands. Here at the University of Michigan, we sometimes like to say sentences like, Michigan is at the forefront of the applications of advanced computing. And I think there's a double meaning to that phrase because Detroit is ground zero for a project of the city that is really at the leading edge of surveillance technology. I'll just tell you a little about it. Um, I had the, the um, delight of uh, interviewing Tawana Petty, a community activist in Detroit, about this project last week. And uh, her work is what informs the remarks I'm going to make uh, to you next. And she'll actually be on campus to talk about that later in the semester. Um, but just for now, uh, my reaction as someone not from Detroit, coming in as a faculty member to the University of Michigan, learning about this is a state that likes apples and cherries and trying to find out what you know, Detroit and Michigan are all about, um, I was struck by the fact that um, if, if you're in Chicago, which I used to live in Illinois, you can look around and there are surveillance cameras mounted to light posts in Chicago, but not that many of them, and they have a flashing blue light. Other cities have this too, Baltimore, New York has this. Uh, I'm sure you've seen what I'm talking about, right? Yeah, okay. Um, and then I, I went to Detroit. So I went to Detroit uh, and you know, if you enter Detroit, it really depends on what direction you go, right? So if you go from Gross Point into Detroit or if you go from Ypsilanti into Detroit or if you go from Ferndale into Detroit, um, depending on which of those paths you intersect or you traverse, um, you go from this uh, space that's you know, potentially something like 80% non-black to a space that's 80% black because Detroit has this history of segregation and the city is currently 80% black. There aren't any flashing blue, green, or other lights that you notice until you hit the city limit. And then as soon as you hit the city limit, if you look around, you'll see a lot of flashing green lights. And you might think to yourself, well, that's funny. It must be the same as Baltimore or Chicago. It must be the same kind of thing. But it's not because Michigan is at the forefront of applications of advanced computing. Um, instead, uh, in Detroit, the idea isn't that the police use surveillance cameras, because I think that's quite normal by this point. The idea is that if you have money, you're able to pay the police for a prioritized tier of police service. Um, it costs about $5,000 to get in on the ground floor, and you have to have a fiber optic connection. Um, if you do that, the police will stop by your uh, place of business, church, or school and sign a log to prove that you're getting what you pay for. Um, you'll, have the, uh, you'll install these cameras, which you might think are just like surveillance cameras that are installed in other cities. But I think another big difference that I was frankly quite shocked to hear about the Detroit program is that in Detroit, the cameras are indoors. Um, so if you visit a public place in Detroit, for example, you go to a restaurant, um, if they participate in Project Greenlight, the, the system is sold with the message that um, a benefit of the system is that the Detroit Police Department does real-time monitoring and it's not announced. So the police can look through your cameras at any time and this is the way the system is sold. So uh, the next time you're in Detroit having something to eat, um, that could be happening. You're not sure who's watching you chew. The other thing that I think is exceptional about Detroit is perhaps because of the um, difficulties the city's had over the years in its uh, municipal organization. The police department has had some difficulties as well. Um, this project was launched without much or anything in the way of policy or oversight. So the policy was launched without guidelines as to how the system would be used. There was some initial hesitation, but um, the people, uh, the people behind the system and its proponents, one of the things they said is they said, well, you know, we promise that we're not going to be doing any kind of systematic computational, you know, facial recognition or something like that until last summer. So last summer, it turned out that it was revealed that the Detroit Police Department was doing um, license plate recognition and facial recognition against the Michigan government database of uh, faces, which is what 
SNAP, or I forget what it's called. Anyway, if you have a license in Michigan, a driver's license or an ID card, your, your face is in that, in that database. So um, I think this is really surprising because being the age that I am, I was assigned in high school to read 1984, and this was presented in terms quite similar to Project Greenlight as a horrible dystopian warning. So I now live uh, in a metropolitan area that is building something that I was raised to think of as a horrible dystopian warning. Here's my problem um, beyond the problems with Project Greenlight, and it's a big problem for me. Maybe you can empathize. I like computers. I really like them. I enjoy computers and I want to do things with them. And I, I used to work as a computer programmer. And so I think my interest in escape is trying to reconcile that feeling with this situation. I like computers. I want to do things with them. And I'm often horrified or appalled by some of the things that seem to be going on with them. So a, a, a panoptic universal surveillance system that Mayor Duggan has said he's so happy with, he's expanding to 1,000 locations. It's currently at 500. Each location has indoor and outdoor cameras and is being uh, used for automatic um, facial recognition. Um, yeah, I, I, it's something that, I, that I, keeps me up. Um, and so I want my colleagues and the community and students and faculty uh, to come together and think about these problems. Um, so that's my motivation for being here, and I thought that that would be a way to kind of explain um, what you're about to see uh, for this event. Um, I'll stop there with the personal story, uh, but then I'll just say a couple of things about logistics. The event is divided into two panels. I've just given you the opening remarks. Um, after the opening remarks, we'll have a, a panel with the distinguished group you'll see here. There'll be a break, then we'll have a second panel, and then after that, a reception at a different location. If you're listening on the live stream, a really key piece of information, actually it's key to you too, if you're listening at all, a really key piece of information is that um, we are going to take questions using um, a, a web page. So if you would like to submit questions, you can do so with your phone. The link uh, to submit a question, I'll, I'll display it when questions start, but you can get ahead of the queue if you want by looking at the event listing on the web at escape.umich.edu and then clicking on the, it says, ask a question for this panel. Um, one of the reasons we're using that tool to ask questions is that we would like to be able to take questions from people on the live stream as well as people who are in the room. It's, uh, we've used it a couple of times in the past. It's usually pretty entertaining because it allows you to upvote questions. So uh, it's a, been a useful way to get feedback from the audience. So that, that's coming when we get to the question and answer period. Um, I think that's the opening. Um, did I forget to say anything, Sylvia? All right. Um, OK, well, it's 1.15. And on time, I'd like to start the first panel. I'm so thrilled to be joined here uh, with this particularly excellent group of guests. Um, I would like to give you a detailed and fulsome introduction of their many accomplishments, which are many. But in the interest of having a conversation with them and with you, um, we put links to their biographies on the event page. So I will only indicate to you that they are an extremely distinguished panel that we're lucky to hear from. Um, and I'll tell you their affiliation. So immediately on my left is Mark DaCosta from Enigma. Um, one more step to the left is Julia Angwin from The Markup. Uh, one more to the left, we have Dana Boyd from Data and Society. And then at the end, uh, we have Jen Janai from Google. Um, I'll, uh, I'll then proceed to the actual panel. This is the end of the preliminaries. <laughs> it's happening. Um, we asked the panelists to consider a, a question, um, accountable technology, long dash, an oxymoron. Um, it's fine with us, however they'd like to answer this question, if it isn't an oxymoron or it is, um, but our preferred structure, which they were warned about, um, is that we'd like them to give only a brief opening statement so that we, ca we can then get into a more interactive presentation. So I'd like to hear from uh, the, I said, that's, that's right, it's brief, yeah. And we are running this on time. Did I mention that? On time, all right. Um, so uh, 
without further ado, I'd love to ask them for their opening. Um, would, would anyone like to volunteer? I'm not going to pick on Mark because he's to my left. So. Julia. Yeah. <laughs> Be sure you speak into the mic for yep. those on the internet and in the room in the back. How is this? Can you guys hear me? Louder? OK, hold on. Better? Really get in there. OK. Great. Thank you. OK. Um, thank you so much. It's such a delight to be here. And um, uh, you know, all, all of the people in my field in journalism are really grateful to Christian for lending his name to an important lawsuit um, that will help computational journalism. And so I just want to publicly thank you for that. A lawsuit that I'm pursuing as a private citizen and not as a representative of the University yes, of Michigan. Correct. <laughs> <laughs> um, and we, that's not the topic right here, so I will we can discuss that later. But I do want to talk about what is accountability, because I think it's a really qu good question, right? Is um, accountable tech an oxymoron? And I think that um, I want to speak as a journalist, because journalism is in the business of accountability. That is our um, watchdog. That's what we should be doing. And uh, the thing is that we are facing an industry that has really is not regulated at all. So traditionally, accountability would come either from top-down regulation or from public pressure up, right? And, and when you say an industry, you're thinking of the tech industry. Yeah, I'm talking about the tech industry and the use of tech in industries that are not considered tech, right? But like, um, you know, like the, the surveillance that you're talking about in Detroit is tech being used by the police. And um, we also happen to have an unaccountable police uh, industry in America as well. So they, they perfectly pair together. Um, but. I guess I want to talk about just the accountability from the ground up, the public pressure piece of it, because that's, um, I feel like I'm on the hook for that as a journalist who's covered technology for uh, many years and decades. Um, <laughs> um, I want to talk a little bit about the evolution of journalism as an accountability watchdog for tech. And um, I, because I think it's helpful to understand where, how we got to where we are, uh, which is that it, when I started as a tech journalist in 1996 at the San Francisco Chronicle, almost every um, newspaper had one person who was assigned to cover tech, and it was usually a white man who was a hobbyist, who was the only person in the newsroom who understood a computer and was a tinkerer. And so our the field really arose, and I say that with great love for a lot of those particular white men, like Walt Mossberg, who I worked for for years, um, they were tinkerers and hobbyists. And honestly, the coverage evolved from sort of a hobbyist and fan position. And so it for a long time, I used to joke that tech journalism felt like sports journalism. It was a little bit more about the spectacle and who won the game, uh, which phone was better, right? Um, what's interesting is we've had an incredible switch in the past three years. And now we're kind of in what I would call a tech lash. And the tech lash is sort of this complete switch where everything is negative in the press about tech. And I think that um, what I feel as a journalist is that we actually need to understand very precisely what the problems are in order to help diagnose them. So I don't know that either end of that, the fan fiction or the complete um, sort of snarkiness, either one really helps the public understanding. Because the truth is, we are in a world where tech is going to be, uh, is already a huge part of our lives and will only get to be a more important part. And what we need to do is precisely diagnose how we can mitigate the risks, right? It's not about ending tech. We're not going to get rid of these things anytime soon unless we get them embedded in our heads, right? which probably will happen. So, um, And so I, I guess I would just like to describe slightly what I'm doing as to, to try to do this is building a new newsroom called The Markup that is a whole mandate is to investigate the impact of technology on society, and we're doing it in a slightly different way than most journalist outfits. It's um, half programmers and half journalists, and we um, work collaboratively to use the best technology to investigate the impact of technology on society. And we also see ourselves as guided by the scientific method. So we develop a hypothesis. You know, a hypothesis might be um, the harms of Detroit's facial recognition program outweigh its benefits, right? That's a, that's a hypothesis. We don't know, though, actually, right? So you would then need to figure out what is the data you need to collect to, um, to support that hypothesis, and can you support that? And then ultimately, we see our stories as having findings, right? Our finding is, yes, the harms outweigh the benefits, 
but there's always going to be a limitation to that finding, right? You never really know for sure. The limitation is we only have this much knowledge, and in the future things might change, or we get imperfect data. We always have imperfect data. And so I think that I'm hoping that by putting out a different kind of accountability work into the world that allows citizens, it treats them as educated consumers and gives them the data to work with and the limitations of that data that perhaps we could raise the discourse around tech accountability. Thank you very much. I, I, I would want to say that um, one of the com parts of the conversation I had with Tawana Petty were about the fact that crime in Detroit has been on a long decline. Uh, and it's very difficult to link the current investments in these systems to um, solving crimes. Uh, it's hard to say why you would need a system like Project Greenlight uh, with the real-time tracking of identifying people across their movements through the city by the government. Um, in order to solve crime, right? Because you I would say that one of the things I think is so amazing, just to piggyback off that for a second, is that the decline in crime, the long-term decline in crime across the nation is one of the unsolved mysteries of our time, and everyone wants to attribute it to something, right? There's the lead in the waters, and there's the there's many different hypotheses out there, and what it, and yet, strangely, it does not stop every single new surveillance technique from being used as, oh, this is the one that's going to stop the already completely declining <laughs> amount of crime. Would another panelist like to jump in at this point? Dana. Um, Got to get really close to that uh, mic, I'm, I think. I'm going to say hi. <laughs> Come here. All right. So one of the things about accountability is that we often take that word for granted, is that we know what it means. But when you hear the term accountability, your knee-jerk response should actually be to think, accountable to whom and under what terms? And I think that's really important because one of the problems that we're having with tech is that we're not sure what the answer to that is. So think about it. Most of these major tech companies that we're talking about, right, big tech, if you will, has backed its way into global governance, not by choice, not by desire, and not even under a rubric that they themselves understand, right? They have their eyes on the idea that they are a corporation situated within a Western context in most cases, and structured within late stage, late stage capitalism. Okay, so these technologies that have been built now affect the flow of information and communication far beyond the boundaries in which they even operate structurally. So here's where we become interesting. So I'm at Data and Society, I'm also at Microsoft Research. I am also one of the people you can blame for having built huge numbers of social media technologies. And so what I can tell you from my own experience and from the experience of my peers is that we all wanted these to be neutral platforms. We all dreamed that like we can build it and people could do great things. And sitting alongside designers, it was just you sat there and you imagined all of the awesome things that could be done. And so you weren't necessarily thinking about being accountable to anyone at all. You were thinking about how you could be accountable to science or to knowledge or to the cool factory. And this is really important because this is before this was cool, right? And so we get to this moment now where this has become a part of our everyday object. And so how do we then think about the accountability in this context and the shaping of all of these environments? So we can critique this. We can talk about how there's no neutral technology. But we still don't know in that critique how to actually grapple with accountability. So what does it mean who should be, who should be accountable to, right? Is it nation states? Are we upholding the post-World War II nation state structure? Is that the thing we're supposed to be doing and on what terms with what states? If we want to be accountable to the public, which public? And what happens when those publics are in con uh, contradiction or challenge with one another? Is one public more legitimate than another public? Who decides? Right, so these questions of accountability to whom are very tricky because the answer at, at, at a cheat, if you want to stay within the corporate context, is to users, which is, in other words, proxy for to consumers. But even there, we have an idea of which ones are more legitimate, more desired, more not. And how do we deal with that when we're dealing with a network environment? So we don't necessarily know who we're talking about. Now, net, under what terms? Under what terms has to do with an articulation of values? Is it just the politicalized, politicized construction of contemporary Western nation states that we care about? Or under the rubric of capitalism that we care about? So are those the orienting angles? And for most of us who talk about ethics or values, we're like, no, that's a terrible idea. And so usually we're trying to resist against that. But what interests do we want to articulate, how, especially in a global context, right? How do we not produce yet another colonial effort? 
Um, and finally, what kinds of governance protocols need to be put in place by all of the various stakeholders and actors and groups? Now, that's way high level. So let's get down to the ground for a second and like, talk about what this looks like in practice. If you talk to Silicon Valley companies and Redmond companies, all of them agree that LGBT, and LGBT employees are some of their most important employees. They want to love them. They want to protect them. They do amazing things in countries where homosexuality is illegal, making certain that their employees are pulled out and are safe, all sorts of great things. So now, this question of like, what does it mean to follow the rules of a nation state? So you've just pulled pull, pull employees out because their, um, their sexuality and their identity is illegal under the state rubric. Okay, so what does it mean then to deal with content? Do you pull out LGBT content in places where it's illegal or not? When it comes to LGBT rights, is it a matter of the individual rights or the collective? If this is a voting structure and every Facebook user was to vote about LGBT content, it would become illegal. So what it, why is it that the Silicon Valley logic of recognition of those of us who are queer has triumphed? And I'm grateful that it has. But how do we then grapple with what kind of minority interests are being protected and how far that logic goes? Right? What minority voices and under what rubric? Under an American rubric? Under you know, a, you know, a Japanese imperialist rubric? Where are we in our rubrics of who are, who are minority groups that are legitimized? Also then, what does it mean as who's a dominant group? That also plays out differently within these different environments. Now, that of course gets us to the key here. We need, when we talk about accountability, we can't avoid the ideas of power, right? And there's, in an academic context, there's many theories of power that we're gonna navigate. Um, but part of it is to realize that accountability, when it, it gets proceduralized, formalizes the chains of power. And so that process of talking about accountability is about formalizing the chains of power and seeing what that looks like. So how do we make certain that that doesn't reify existing problematic structures of power. And this is one of the reasons why the questions of accountability with regard to tech systems is so messy, because the tech left to its own devices will reinforce all of the structural inequities that are built in. And again, we went high for a second, so let's go back to Practal. Um, Latanya Sweeney is a professor at uh, Harvard, and one day she was talking with a journalist and she was trying to remember a paper she had written because us academics suck at remembering our own writing. So she threw her name into Google, figuring she could go and uh, find her old paper. And the journalist looks over her shoulder and is like, why are you getting criminal justice questions associated with your name? And she looked over and there was a set of ads which was Latanya Sweeney arrested. And she was like, that's weird. Now she's a computer scientist, so what she did is she took the corpus of baby names and threw it at Google to see what would happen. And what she found was that there was a company um, that was had six unique different background check, some with criminal justice, some around employment, some in all these different areas. But she also noticed that you know, black baby names were more likely to get uh, association with criminal justice products. Now, this is not because Google decided that it was a racist enterprise and let you buy on black na baby names. That's not at all what happened. Google lets you buy on certain categories in its ads, and one of them has to do with people. And the thing is, is that they are sitting on a machine learning system that evolves to figure out which ad matched with which queries is more likely to give you a better connection. Well, funny enough, the society that is searching for names like Latanya is racist. And so when they were searching for names that are black, they were more likely to click on the products when they were given a criminal justice um, ad. So they taught Google how to be racist like the rest of society was. So who there is now responsible, right? Is Google's responsibility to look out for the ways in which racism is getting reified? How are they the ones that are accountable within which contexts? What does it mean to navigate racial logic and racial histories in the US versus in India? Is it a matter of a racist public who's training that system? Where do we intervene? And that's where I think about this all the time, you know, as I sit on search engines and working with the team at Bing at Microsoft. You know, one of the biggest puzzles we've been going over are things like a query for CEO um, that our dear friend here has constantly pointed out. And a search for CEO brings an amazing glossy collection of white men smiling in full Getty ads, right? <laughs> And here's the problem of that kind of query. People do not tag their content with CEO. 
right? They tag it maybe if you're lucky with actual CEOs in practice, but they don't even link off of that term. That's not a search engine optimized term. People tag the term CEO to images when they're trying to sell images. And that's what you have to realize about a, a query like CEO. Who's doing that query? People who build pre um, PowerPoint decks, right? They need to put up an image for their like Accenture deck to show that they're like the awesome consultant. Um, and what that means is that Getty Images wants to make certain that their images are the ones that, that Accenture over there goes and buys. And so they're producing images and optimize it for the PowerPoint deck creating consultants. So they then say, okay, what is gonna make us most money? Of course, society being racist, they're like, ah, when we take pictures of white men and mark them as CEO, they get purchased. So we are gonna double down on taking those pictures and maximizing the SEO of those, right? And so they reify it. And of course, your consultants over here buy them up, right? And they pay for them because none of us buy them. We just use the watermarked versions, right? Go academia. Um, so this is all about this sort of ecosystem. So again, where is the accountability? Where is the intervention? And this is only at the level of just normative racist biases within uh, American society. When you then deal with this at a global level, you deal with it when you're dealing with manipulation and explicit racist ideologies, you have a whole other mess. So I say all of this to say that as we're talking about accountability, how do we take a systems level approach so we're really getting back to the accountable to who and under what terms in a way that actually recognizes this is not about linear structures of power, but ones that are deeply, deeply networked. Thank you so much, Dana. I want to say for the audience that we have full licensed rights to use this image of the <laughs> escape key. Um, more seriously, now I think the end of your remarks was so powerful that I'm sure we're going to talk about the questions that you raised about responsibility and its diffusion, depending on whether a platform is perhaps implementing a decision or reflecting some actions by its users. Uh, but I also want to flag, just for my notes so that we get back to it, the beginning of your remarks, you had some very provocative things about um, tech being cool and how that might potentially, I'm reading in a little, distract us from accountability. I mean, I, um, I read Douglas Copeland Microsurfs in the 1990s. I don't know if anyone read that. And one of, the, um, one of the quotes in there that I liked is that he said he just couldn't understand why people were so excited about what was essentially an office supply company. And he was talking about Microsoft, where Dana is also at uh, Microsoft Research. Um, so I think sometimes the excitement of tech, which is also how I started this panel, I, I told a story about how I love computers, right? So that, that can actually lead us in a direction that's not the best one to go to. So I'd love to get back to cool and accountability as well at some future point. Um, but, but let's hear from the panelists who haven't spoken yet. Who wants to go next? Great, Jen. So oh, yeah, I'm Jen, head of responsible innovation at Google. Yeah, right, right into that microphone, just right really okay. close to it. Okay. Okay. <laughs> uh, yelling out in my Irish accent probably isn't the best idea. Um, so uh, when I looked at the the title for this talk, what came to my mind is the the oxymoron part that accountable algorithms essentially removes the agency and ownership from the people who build the algorithms. So it's it can sound like an excuse to say, well, it was the algorithm. The algorithm got something wrong. Um, and so for for us, when when we think about accountability in Google, we're trying to think about who are the decision makers, who are the coders, who's going to deploy that technology, and what are the levels of accountability that they're taking on. So I agree with Dana. We can't do it alone. Uh, Google can't pretend to own every part of the stack of the deployment, but it's not an excuse to not do all that we can in, in terms of accountability. So the questions we do ask are uh, the same. So accountability for what and to whom? And there's not a single answer, so our work doesn't focus on a, a single area. Um, our research uh, spans areas like explainability and interpretability. Do people explain what the technology should be doing um, in order to understand is it working in the way that it's intended? That also tries to mitigate against the assumption that why this technology is cool and it's going to be cool to hold our, our builders and coders accountable to, but did you check to make sure that it will work out the way that you intended. So how do we also include uh, diverse voices, not just in the building of the technology, but also the testing of the technology. So we've also expanded our work in testing algorithms to make sure that they are doing what they're supposed to be doing, but they're also doing in a way that aligns with our AI principles. So for those who don't know, um, Google has released our AI principles about 18 months ago, and these define essentially our um, ethical roadmap for how we will develop and deploy AI. 
AI. They cover principles like do not create or reinforce bias, ensure that our technology is accountable to people, is called out as a specific principle, uh, but we also have the guardrails. So these are technologies and applications we will not build. So we will not build weapons technology, we will not build large-scale surveillance technologies, to your point, um, but how do we know we're not doing that? So accountability is on a team like mine, a responsible innovation, where we uh, essentially red team test some of our algorithms and products to, in, to ensure that they're doing what they should be doing. So red team testing is in addition to the explainability, interpretability, and the coding side. We also want to make sure, um, can our users contest decisions? So contestability, an area of research as well, um, in terms of can someone appeal a decision that was made? If they feel that this decision isn't reflective of their experience online, do they have the ability to contest that decision? And is there an ability to provide feedback? A so decision like a ban or something like yep. that, yeah. So if we remove content um, uh, or shut down an advertiser account, they have an ability to say, why did that happen? I disagree for these reasons, and how do we handle that? So there is not one answer to the accountability. It's, there's various teams at various stages along the life cycle where we have to be asking that question all the way along. But to the question then of uh, it's not just us, we also, and just this week, our CEO Sundar um, called for more regulation in certain areas. So in areas like facial recognition deployment, is that something that we should uh, pause on to ask more questions of in which situations is facial recognition useful? Is it for identifying children who have been trafficked, a very socially uh, beneficial goal of identifying children um, who, ha who, who have been trafficked, but that same technology, as you mentioned, can be used for, for other purposes that may be violating some of our privacy or, or other norms. So um, how can regulators play a role in accountability? How can we contribute what we're doing on the accountability side, but also how do we share what we've learned? We don't have all the answers, but we're trying very hard to test and try, and then once we feel like this was useful to us in this area, how do we share that with the world? Uh, example here being uh, model cards is a, is a, a research technology we recently um, uh, released from Google, from our researchers in our Google AI department, uh, which essentially is a nutrition label for models. It tells you what this model is supposed to do, what inputs that model used, so you can understand uh, with um, a certain level of just layperson intuition of what this model is supposed to do. Because we also want to make sure that full transparency can lead to confusion. If we're just saying, here, here's our whole algorithm, that's not going to help an everyday user. It's not going to help an everyday policymaker to understand. So to Dana's point, um, to who are we being accountable? And are we speaking in their language instead of trying to confuse them and obfuscate the information by making it too complicated? So accountability is as I say, all along the life cycle, we're trying to think about accountability by design. It's not just at the end point that we're saying, has it done what it was supposed to do? Are we building it from the start um, to, to reach those um, goals? Um, and I think one of the other things to, to keep in mind is accountability, apart from is it accountable to doing what it's supposed to do, have we also checked that it's not doing what it's not supposed to do? So you can achieve one goal, but still also achieve these um, other potential nefarious or, or um, unintentional consequences. So part of our adversarial testing and our reviews also tries to identify how could this be harmful? Who is it going to be harmful to? Um, and if there's any chance of harm, are we making sure that there's overall benefit, um, even if there may be uh, some harm? And when I, when I usually say that, I get questioned, well, so you're saying some harm is okay, and the example we'll use is um, self-driving cars. Self-driving cars we know will save more lives than, than what humans will cause in accidents, but we can't pretend that they won't cause some accidents. But the overall good of protecting more lives than human drivers is worth um, the technology that we may do there. So the overall proportionate um, considerations around benefits versus harms is very important when we think about accountability. We're accountable to as positive outcomes as possible while acknowledging the potential for harms. Thank you so much for that, Jen. I mean, the, the remarks I think we might circle back to later uh, that are particularly relevant to this moment are the ones that you made about regulation. I mean, we're, I think, about a year after the introduction of the Canadian um, algorithmic impact assessment framework, and there's movement in many governments to uh, introduce new agencies, new regulations that have to do with the technologies that we've been discussing. Um, I think it's, it's fascinating that, um, so if, if you have a background um, related to public policy or legal theory, um, 
it's not that surprising to see that some of the best um, advocates and proponents for these regulations have been tech companies. Um, there's idea in legal theory that um, it's often in the interest of regulated industries to propose uh, some sort of compromise regulation system that can it can help secure their uh, market position, it can help protect them from competitors. Uh, and so it's, it's really fascinating to be at the moment when there seems to be a consensus emerging that regulation and uh, public policy is an avenue we should pursue. So I'd love to, to circle back on that and, and wonder about how effective that is and, and what, what we should do to make it more effective uh, if, if there's a problem. So, but I'll, I'll move on to our, our last panelist, Mark. Great, thanks uh, Christian and Sylvia and Todd and everyone who uh, worked to pull this great event together. Really sort of excited to be here with Gotta be really close to the mic, I'm really sorry. Really close, yeah. all right, gonna lean in. They'll, they'll, um, they like it in the back, I, I bet. So yeah, no, fantastic. So, you know, I approach the question of uh, accountable technology sort of from two different vantage points. Um, one is through kind of a grounding in history of science and cultural anthropology that's um, very focused on um, kind of the you know, social contexts in which ideas are developed and, and emerge and sort of become uh, operational in, in sort of society at large. Uh, and the, the other avenue is sort of as a practitioner. So I started a technology company called Enigma in New York, uh, which does a lot of work um, really around basically organizing public data and public information in order to make uh, you know, fundamentally government more accountable and to make uh, uh, sort of a higher degree of visibility about what people are doing in, in the public arena. Um, and so when I think about the question of accountable technology, I think it's really essential, especially because we are at such a transitional, pivotal sort of moment right now, to really pay attention to how this narrative has sort of developed in the recent past um, and how we may be able to take some lessons from previous examples of these things emerging as, as guideposts in some ways. So, you know, I think as, um, you know, both Julia and Dana kind of alluded to in different ways, you know, I think we're all familiar with this sort of long 1990s of, of you know, sort of tech celebration and exceptionalism championed, you know, probably most visibly by magazines like Wired, but was really part of the, the sort of, um, you know, sports fan fiction uh, zeitgeist of that time. Um, you know, then we, sort of go through September 11th, uh, the sort of uh, emergence of a kind of security surveillance state out of that, but you know, more or less uh, shortly thereafter, we sort of have um, you know, uh, a real sort of mainstreaming of the, the optimism that the tech industry can sort of deliver. So I think it's fascinating when you go back and look at um, you know, the two Obama campaigns as an example. So uh, in his first election victory, there, were, there was a lot of, um, you know, analogies and celebrations uh, of Barack Obama's almost being like a John F. Kennedy of, of YouTube, sort of drawing their parallel to how, you know, Richard Nixon was sort of just a terrible TV presence and presenter, and Kennedy really sort of struck a note of the, the future at that time. And then, of course, in, um, Obama's second election, there was a real excitement and celebration of his sophistication in using, um, you know, data analytics and uh, really progressive techniques of um, engaging democracy, being responsive to constituents, and and building a message around that. And I think it's you know sort of utterly uh, incredible that you know when we then go to the 2016 election, you know there were uh, journalists embedded in Hillary Clinton's campaign that the day after the election were ready to um, run articles about her algorithm and sort of a continuation of this legacy of bringing the sophistication of Silicon Valley into a kind of progressive improvement in government. And then of course, you know, there's many causalities to this, but then we wake up after election day and it's, you know, holy shit, what, what's kind of going on here and, and how far have we let these technologies go? Um, you know, one of the things that I think is really fascinating about this moment that we're in right now is you know, a lot of this technological change has, it, you know, at least with the information, uh, sort of, uh, information communication technology and all these sorts of things, has, you know, in, in some ways really come onto the scene very quickly. But I think there's an interesting example to sort of consider that may have some suggestions for the future when we think about um, the history and, and problems of, um, like, industrial monopoly regulation generally. So, 
uh, I think it was in the 1860s that the first antitrust laws uh, in Illinois came on the books. And um, if you think about it sort of at this time, this form of industrial capitalism and, and factory economy and all of these things were you know, really just at the forefront of emergence right then. And uh, you sort of, on the one hand, see this early uh, response using the legal system to try to address it, but it really wasn't for 50 years until really like the 1910 or 11 or something like this when uh, the Sherman Antitrust Act was actually used to break up uh, Standard Oil and, and sort of reassert some of um, uh, these public uh, pushback and reorganization around the economy and society around these things. Are you predicting 2070? Is that what I'm hearing? Well, what I, I hope it doesn't take that long. What I think was sort of amazing, though, d during that 50-year period is what sort of happened to build a broad base of political understanding and will, uh, and sort of the how did this kind of become possible. Uh, that's, of course, a really long story. One thing that I think I just sort of latch on to sometimes, no pun intended, is the political cartoons that were circulating around it. And in many respects, for monopolies, uh, the octopus became sort of a key rallying symbol of what these companies were doing to you know, the country and to politics and to working people and became a sort of way of focusing attention and mind around it. I think, of course, the problem we have today is that 19th century ideas of consumer price pr protection and, and the you know, anti-competitive rhetoric that was really important to, to sort of developing new political responses to industrialization are not, I think, uh, sort of fit for purpose for the problems we have today. I think what's, you know, we're in this amazing moment where we're in a tech lash, uh, as it's been called. Criticisms are really coming to the fore. I think there's so much sophisticated work doing, uh, going on to sort of diagnose and position the problems. Um, and we're really at a moment, I think, where we're trying to come up with alternative visions of the future and of the organization of capital and economy and, and society. Um, and I think, you know, I would just sort of end this on saying that I, I would actually like to take a, an optimistic view on that because I think, you know, there's so many issues around wealth inequality, environmental degradation, uh, you know, sort of a general crisis in democratic governance that this becomes, I think, a moment as we seek to redefine our relationship, the public's relationship with technology and with these broader uh, ways that we're interconnected and related. Uh, that can be addressed uh, and, and uh, sort of account for some of these more systemic issues that are now trying to find a political expression. So. Mark, thank you for being the first to swear. I appreciate that. <laughs> I, I would have I done it myself if I thought of it, but that's great. So uh, thank you. But in addition, I think Mark has just put something on the table that I really love, and that's the idea of the octopus. I'm not sure what animal would represent the tech industry in the context of today. I'm thinking the pangolin is very armored, the the fighting shrimp is fierce. I'm not sure, but... Um, <laughs> okay, okay. I mean, I do like animals as opposed to plants, but that's a bias. So um, I'm now going to switch into the Q&A section um, of the presentation. So um, just to be clear, in case you haven't been looking at this, um, uh, if you go to the URL um, that's uh, currently displayed in extremely small font at the top of the screen, or it's also on the event announcement for this page, that's escape.umich.edu slash plan one, then you have uh, the opportunity to submit a question. The questions on this screen will change as the people in this room and on the internet vote on them. So they will percolate up and down, so there will be some movement on this screen. Uh, and then I will flag the questions that we respond to as we go. Um, I think that's all I need to say about that. It's pretty, pretty clear. Uh, you can tell it's probably better for all of us that we don't pass the mic in this room because you have to get really close to these mics. It's like a training period involved. Um, so, I mean, um, so just so it's clear, if you're using this uh, on your computer or your phone, you want to ask a question by pressing the green button that says plus question mark, all right? So that's not going to display on my screen because I want to use all the room for um, questions. Um, so. Uh, respond to two of them. Uh, to two of them. Well, then I have to find them. But sure, I yeah. Them. Let's. I, I mean, them. I was going to choose them, but I'm not hurt at all. Like that's fine. <laughs> go go ahead. Uh, let's, uh, no, please. I just, one's really quick, which is right. um, the reason I gave the CEO example is because what? it's one of the ones that um, the companies have actually been able to clean up from. For Wait, are you going to say which question it is though? The one that was a CEO that got up that. Oh, 
have my name in it. Oh. I'm just like, I gave that example because it's one of the ones where we found it and started trying to find ways to clean it up. So, yes, you are right. It is not, it is cleaned up right now and this has been part of the iterative process. Um, but the other thing I wanted to respond to is actually to Jen, but I wanna, I wanna, um, I want to put in a, a sort of piece of history here. So Madeline Ellis, she's a um, data society researcher, and she was really interested in the history of aviation. Um, and so she went into the 1970s regulations around autopilot. Um, and the reason why this is really important is because Congress at the time was debating whether or not they should be able to allow autopilot to be introduced into airplanes, and if so, whether or not the people that are in the cockpit should be removed from it. Um, and they went back and forth, and part of it was because there was a lot of early data showing that planes would be safer if they were pl flown, flown in an augmented fashion with it mostly being automated. Um, indeed, that is proven to be very, very accurate. But there's some really interesting caveats to that, which is what Madeline is so interested in. Um, first, the other thing you should know, in the 70s, they decided the navigator was irrelevant, so we can sort of um, acknowledge there used to be three people in the pl plane. Now. I probably fly uh, more than most people, um, and it's one of those painful things when I talk to pilots because I get on a plane all the time knowing full well that that is a totally automated process. And that those babysitters, those babysitters of machines that have been assigned by various laws to sit there, haven't had the opportunity to fly a plane in a really long time. And not only have they not been able to fly a plane for a really long time, but um, they are supposed to step in when all goes wrong. And that's a really important part of this puzzle. So this goes back to Madeline Ellish. She argued that what those pilots have become are liability sponges for the airline industry. They are actually who becomes responsible when the machine goes wrong. And she argues that this creates the construction of a moral crumple zone. A crumple zone being that part of your car that absorbs on impact. Now the reason I'm telling you this in, in light of uh, uh, auto, um, uh, auto aviation or auto driving is that actually most of the research that's coming out shows that we suck as drivers, right? We fall asleep, we, we get distracted by our texting, we do a whole variety of other things. But there's another part to this puzzle where things get dicey. The more that we turn it over to self-driving cars, the worse drivers we will become. Right? We will get worse at this job. And that will make it more required for automation to be a part of it. But then what happens when automation stops actually being evaluated? And the answer should be obvious in the parallel to aviation. It's called Boeing, right? Boeing made it visible that their ability to do automation, they had taken control so actively from the pilot and so unable for a pilot to step in that when they stopped actually being challenged and seen and evaluated for their technical prowess, they were able to build a system that was fundamentally flawed. And that's where the place that I would lead you there and I, won't, I will stop is I would re recommend the Challenger launch decision by Diane, um, uh, why am I blanking on her last name? Vaughn, thank you, um, which is a phenomenal di dynamic of how these systems can go so terribly awry. And I'll stop. It, it sounded like someone else wanted to jump in there, but was that, no, okay. I can ask another question. Yeah, all right. So, I mean, um, I think I'd like to ask perhaps the top upvoted question, although I reserve the right to make more editorial judgment in the future. But for right now, I'm going to ask the top upvoted question, but I'd love it if other people answered as well. And, and not, we did not take the question, which is, who is Google accountable to? I would like it if it wasn't just asked to the person from Google. It'd be interesting to hear answers from other people. I'll certainly, I'll certainly start. Sorry, bring it forward again. Um, so it goes to one of the points that Dana made as well, that um, who are we accountable to isn't just one group, that we do have to consider a variety of stakeholders and the methods of being accountable to them then differs depending on who they are. So the stakeholders we would think about are our end users. Um, so are we building products that are useful for them, that are beneficial for them. But they're not the only ones affected by our products. There can be the indirect effects on society then, that even if you're not a direct user, how are we affecting society at large? So then we consider how do we be accountable to larger society? 
other stakeholders are, are re regulators and policymakers. How and in what way um, are they asking for accountability in our products? So again, with reg regulation being discussed um, across the world, how are we sharing what we've learned to inform some of those decisions without guiding where they necessarily have to go? That if we're practicing it, we should be sharing what we're learning as we go. So for us, accountability is not a single group in a single way. It is anyone directly or indirectly affected by our products as well as interested in what our products will be doing. So it's quite broad and it is certainly not single person in a single way, um, which is why with the, the list of areas of accountability is to try and match the needs of all those stakeholders um, in the way that is uh, appropriate for those different groups. Just, anyone else want just to? on a yeah. factual basis, like um, the, the way that Google is held accountable largely is for deceptive practices under the Federal Trade Commission rules. That's the main law policing internet companies in the, in the US, United States. Yeah. In the United States. And honestly, that means that um, as long as you say you're doing a bad thing, it's fine to do the bad thing. So I just want to be clear about what the legal landscape is for accountability right now, which is why um, it feels very whiplashy. Like, so every week there's another, like, YouTube is going to ban this or YouTube is going to ban that because what's actually happening is public pressure is mostly what's holding accountable right now is something flares up and then there's like a patch, right? And it doesn't, I'm not a policy person, um, but doesn't it seem like the best way to do policy? I mean, isn't, isn't <laughs> a dimension of that that I think you're perhaps alluding to also that the, for the public to know about something, we need the media. And the media brings a set of biases to what makes a, a story of the moment and how the story is covered. And that this is this is our current accountability system is that it's biased toward like a certain kind of I don't I, I would say telegenic, but it's not audiovisual quite often. But it's like a telegenic fiasco with certain protagonists, and then that raise, raises to then people should pay attention to it. So the yeah. I would say though that like I, I totally agree with you, but um, it's better than it was. If that's anything, a consolation. So you mean journalism? Uh, yeah, weirdly. I mean, because uh, l let's talk about me too, right? So I didn't like, mean to sound so skeptical. No, it's no, just, it's, my tone I'm, of voice came out that way. <laughs> I mean, journalism. Uh, uh, well, I would just say this: like when I was covering, when I was at the Wall Street Journal, and I was just covering big companies, like uh, it never occurred to me to write about all the women who are being driven out of those companies by sexual harassment, like it literally did not occur to me as a woman that that was a news. <laughs> and then when Me Too broke up in and it suddenly became that that was news, I was like, oh wow, look at all the stories I could have written all those years. And, um, and that I attribute actually to the fact that the public has more of a voice in surfacing problems through social media. And so s journalists have to listen to that a little bit I am not in any way like the last defender of journalism. I would just say that like there there are more voices that can be heard now than used to be when there were five white men in a room who made the decision to ban a page of any particular newspaper. And I will say something I wanted to add about antitrust. We we're talking about the octopus. Um, one of the main things that led to the conditions for antitrust um, for the passage of the Sherman Act was pioneering journalism. And the muckrakers of the turn of the century, Ida Tarbell, is really my personal heroine. She wrote, she did sort of original data journalism of her day, which was literally going county, county to county and collecting documents and records showing Standard Oil abusing its monopoly and writing a multi-part series in McClure's magazine that really changed public opinion. And I view her as a real um, guiding light for like how we should approach our journalism at this similar, I feel, change of um, changing time where I think there is going to be regulation, but we need to expose the problem. I want to throw another piece to this because the question is, who is Google accountable to? And I think Jen and, and folks are rightfully saying, who should they be accountable to? And I, as um, Julia pointed out, like, yes, there is this accountability to g US government structures. But part of what I think has been rendered invisible in a lot of our modern day tech environment is what the finance structures <coughs> have done to this whole process. And so let's let's tell this. And I, I'll use Google because it was the question asked, but this is relevant for everybody. So Google is a public company um, in the United States under Wall Street. That means it's regulated in certain ways by SEC, and that means it has certain responsibility to stockholders. 
Okay? That means that it can't tell its employees certain things before it tells the street and tells everybody that. So let's acknowledge the way in which that becomes a bounding function of information flows in ways that are actually should be questioned and challenged because the way that we've gotten to what we have in terms of Wall Street is part of this puzzle. Now, it is accountable to Wall Street, but it's not simply has that structure just for its return on investment um, uh, interests, right? Which, by the way, includes endowments of universities. Okay, so there's all of these interesting cycles, which is, by the, by the way, one of the reasons why people who are putting pressure on universities to really think strategically about the endowments, and the universities are like, but it's okay to invest in things that are really corrupt because we really want it for the money, right? So this is where we're all implicated in this process. Now, the other reason why tech is so interesting in this environment is, is it's one of the only sectors in which the vast majority of the professional class gets paid in primarily in the form of stock. So most tech employees get a huge chunk of their compensation in stock. What does this mean? This means that if the stock starts going down, employees leave for other employees in a, in a complicated market. So this means that there is an undue pressure both in the ability to keep engineers and the ability to appease investors to make certain that that stock price keeps going up. So what do you need to think about in an information economy, whether we're talking about uh, uh, for-profit journalism or whether we're talking about a corporation that does information? You need to find more users, okay, hard. You need to diversify your profit and loss structures so that you actually have different products that you can offer. Some of the big companies have done a better job of that than others. Or you need to find ways of making more money per user on the existing products. Explain to me how that does not get gross, right? And so this is this really interesting challenge because the accountability mechanisms that we have set up in this stage of financialized uh, capitalism, late stage capitalism, are such that even as we talk about what regulation looks like, regulation puts guardrails on things, and it, indeed, the reason for antitrust is because it allows you know to level the playing field in some interesting way, um, which is often at the benefit of the large companies. But the challenge with this is that this is actually a very different configuration than when Standard Oil was at bay. Standard Oil was paying its workers nothing. Right? Standard Oil benefited by a whole variety of things where the breakup from it did not actually disrupt different aspects of the flows of, of things because they just ended up creating separate companies that flowed into each other. So this is one of those reasons why I really, ch I want us to come up with a new model of antitrust. I actually think we should be having that thick conversation, but I don't want us to deploy what we understood from Sherman Act as being all relevant today because it doesn't actually deal with the ways in which late stage capitalism has evolved capitalism so insidiously. And that's one of the reasons why the tech industry is notable, in part because it's the industry that was birthed post takeover culture of the 80s. And so it actually has all of the hallmarks of trying to respond to the horrific kinds of financial manipulations of the 80s. And this is one of the reasons why in individuals own too much of a company. They do this and they're not, a ch they're not accountable because people didn't want the takeover dynamic. So part of it is, is that whenever you're looking at tech companies, whenever you're looking at these systems, look at finance sides of this. This is the stuff that is not visible and this goes back to journalism. Journalism doesn't actually pay attention to the money parts of it nearly as well. Congress calls in the CEO founders who know nothing about what their companies do. Call in the CFOs. Right? This is one of the dynamics that people are really not, it's not made visible, so they look at either the tech or they look at the executive and their branding and their cool factor. You have to look at ways in which the money, not just VC capital, but the street has perverted this whole thing. I mean, this really is another couple of questions that are up there. Um, so I'd like to continue this same conversation that we're already having, but just maybe uh, change path a little bit. So one questioner asks, does the profit motive of these organizations cause a conflict of interest? And I think we're already talking about that. Maybe I could deepen that a little bit with an anecdote. I was at a conference a couple of years ago with a well-known uh, Marxist philosopher named Christian Fuchs, who I'm pretty sure isn't going to be watching, so I can say whatever I want. Um, so uh, I was at a conference with him. He's based in Sweden. The conference was in Europe. We were talking about Google. I'm sorry, I didn't know all my examples would be about Google, but we were talking about Google. 
people were saying terrible things that Google had done in, the, in their view, and um, Christian Fuchs stood up and he said, we just have to say the one word that's on everybody's mind right now, because we're all thinking it, and I didn't know what he was talking about, so I was very curious as to what the word was going to be, and there was a big pause, and then he said, nationalization. And as an, as an American, I thought that he was joking. And I think that's interesting as well, because the idea of like President Donald Trump nationalizing Google is so hard for me to you know, even conceive of. But as a Swede, I think that actually he was serious and he was not making a joke. The reason I use that anecdote, however, is that there are other motives for incentives beyond profit, and we've used them in the past in the media. So universities in the United States were instrumental in the idea of bringing a public interest media system, uh, which was perhaps in the English-speaking world birthed in Britain, into the United States. How well it works, I don't know. I'm not sure I'm ready to endorse it, but there are other models, right? You could say, look at Facebook. It's got some problems. What if it worked more like a charity? What if it was like Wikipedia? I mean, Wikipedia is like the only example we have of this, but there are other models. Can we think creatively about this profit problem and think, there, is there some other way we can imagine a, a public system, an alternative system? People are trying. I don't know if anyone's on Mastodon. There, there, there are attempts. I have a lot of mic, but I want to challenge you because I actually do not think that you can simply do it while upkeeping the broader structure of where financial, financialized interests are. So like Anil Dash, um, who is currently the CEO at Glitch, um, he sort of had a little bit of a panic attack when he realized that no company that was birthed after 2010 that has had any level of sticking power didn't have VC backing, and that, uh, which is not true when we were birthed in the tech industry, and that um, on top of that, you literally can't open a new restaurant in New York City without getting VC backing, right? That's insane. So part of it is, is that I think this is where it's the question of what's the financial motive is different about how to be sustainable financially versus how to make certain that investors can keep making more money each quarter. That is a very different kind of commitment because the historical version of getting uh, investment was that you would get the investment and you would return it like a bank with a decent margin and then you would own the system. That's not what exists anymore. You are just pulled into the ground over and over again and you have to go on a treadmill to make more money and more money and more money. And that's what's heartbreaking to me. Like, you, you mentioned Wikipedia, they are drowning and they are working on begathons as their primary way of monetizing. So it's not like they don't need capital. They need capital. But can I, can I uh, redirect a little? I think I agree with you. And I think, though, uh, in order to change the incentives of the system as it stands, we also need an imagination of alternatives. We need some Absolutely. sense of what we might be working toward. And I agree that currently there's not a big roster of options. Like, I'm not saying, wouldn't it be great if everything was like Wikipedia? Or I love public broadcasting so much, that's the way everything should work because it's perfect. I'm, I'm saying, do we have other options? Like, what are they? Is there, what's the imaginary here? That's your center's job. <laughs> I, to, to respond to that, I feel like part of the challenge where we do have like a zone that we have sort of a poverty of of concepts and language is, you know, the ex to the really understanding the extent to which places like Facebook and, and Google and Twitter have be have sort of come to replace or sort of stand in in some ways for like a kind of a public square, right? And the extent to which, to the you know, to the extent to which we believe that liberal democracy in the United States is somehow possible because of, uh, you know, an, ex an exchange of ideas and sort of, um, you know, that the sort of citizen participation in democratic processes uh, is, is possible in that kind of 18th century fantasy way. Um, the fact that these platforms are private enclosures that are not only operated under a profit motive with a concentrated capitalization table, but in the cases of companies like Facebook, I mean, it's Mark Zuckerberg basically controls the voting stock of the company. So, I mean, it's, you know, the, it, I think, you know, in, certainly in, you know, 50 years when people look back at this, it's, it, it will make absolutely no sense that, pe that we sort of let this persist. But I think we don't have a good way of understanding, you know, 
how these are the places where kind of politics happens necessarily because it's the zones through which we communicate and ideate and, and work through a lot of this stuff. I don't, I don't have an answer for that, but I think it's a... I'm still so, waiting for yeah, the... So, <laughs> perhaps it can be an animal. Uh, I'd also like to respond, Christian, to your uh, kind of challenge of how to think about this, that my concern would be to that we would simplify and put the onus on one group then to solve the problem. And to the original question about the conflicts of interest is there's conflicts of interest by every group. Politicians have to be voted in again. Journalists need as many readers as possible. We need to, to Dana's point, maximize shareholder value. And I really like the approach uh, that Dana described because uh, for us, the technology does have to be sustainable. It's about kind of long-term growth. So it's not just about what's going to get us through short term. It's only if we're trusted and people use our products is there any value in the long run. So getting this right and being accountable to many different groups, not just one, is part of that. So the conflicts of interest should be negated by one another and everyone is held accountable to the next group. Journalists are going to be held accountable to their readers and politicians are held accountable to their voters and we are held accountable to all of those groups. I would be concerned if it landed on one group to get it right because then what are they motivated by? So I think it's very important that the conflicts of interest are acknowledged, but there are multiple groups challenging that conflict of interest. Well, universities are pure. Academics don't respond to incentives at all. Publishing. <laughs> oh, I'm just kidding. That's a joke. It's not, yeah. So, uh, I, have, I have other questions we can move on. You're looking at me, so I will. All right, so um, uh, a great question uh, that's currently uh, leading in the polls is um, how can we bring more people into this conversation? I'm, I'm going to edit it slightly because it, it was also asked to me, but I would love if we just ask the question for everybody. How can we bring more people into this conversation? I mean, the questioner is particularly highlighting the fact that um, there's, a, there's a sort of prestige ranked list of which companies, which universities, perhaps even which countries, which governments are able to participate in this high level conversation. So how, how can we bring more people into this conversation? Also, also which, where they live and, and what you know, their incomes and their ability to engage and uh, the amount of free time they have, and so how, how do we do it? The conversation about ethics, society, and computing, I should say. Yeah. I mean, I guess I would just say, like, I think as um, a journalist, we're trying to bring it to... Really, clo really close to the to, mic, yeah. And journalists, I'm trying to at least bring this conversation to different types of communities through making our newsroom nonprofit and our all of our stories being Creative Commons so they can be republished for free anywhere. So um, our hope is to distribute to um, as many places as possible because one of the one of the reasons this conversation isn't penetrating is because of the death of journalism across the country, which honestly is um, not entirely the fault of the tech industry, but like can be large, a lot of it can be attributed to the fact that, you know, when I worked at the Wall Street Journal for 14 years, like the reason we could sell so much, uh, our ads for so much money and sustain such high quality journalism was that if you wanted to reach a, a guy who with a Mercedes who golfed on weekends, who was a middle manager, like you basically had to be in the Wall Street Journal or maybe Forbes or something. Um, nowadays, because we've allowed um, this sort of surveillance economy, you, you wouldn't pay the premium of the Wall Street Journal to get that person. You can just follow them around on the internet and build this dossier. And honestly, that person is cheaper and easier to reach when they're reading some kind of clickbait stuff that they're not totally focused on and they will look at the ad where, the, where they're, if they're absorbed in the article. Actually, they're not as likely to be attracted to the ad. So the basically all quality journalism is suffering greatly and most newspapers, I don't know what's happening here in Ann Arbor, but in most states, like a lot of the really famous and established papers are, are gutted. Barely anything is left of them. And so it's a crisis of democracy. Like the reason we're not having this conversation is partly because we don't have um, our community um, media anymore. And so anyways, I am of course like living off of philanthropic donations like Wikipedia, so it's going to be a begathon <laughs> forever. But um, that's the only model right now for journalism that works, which is really tragic. I mean, as a follow-up, I think as a non-journalist, one impression that I have is that you could perceive social media and the tech industry as going to war with journalism. Like, I think that's a part of the story about what's happened to journalism in this country, or at least Facebook. I mean, I know some journalists feel that way. Do I have that right? I mean, by, by changing how people find news. Yeah, I mean, the thing is now um, they're the gatekeepers for news, right? And so basically you have to 
uh, live and die by the gatekeepers. And it, when, the, when the gatekeepers were people, so it was a much simpler time when news was physical and there was a news shack or whatever. In New York, there are little kiosks, but you know, there was a store and you paid for placement and it was like transaction, right? At least you knew if you could pay enough, you could get a better slot. Now it's not like that at all, right? The algorithm makes a decision. And what's beautiful about algorithms is they're really just an accountability avoidance mechanism, right? So that's the true purpose of the algorithm is to be like, I didn't make the decision. Like no one at Google is like uh, making this decision, right? That's just the computer is making it. And so there's no one to argue with. And I mean, there are of course, attempts you can make to, to complain and this and that, but honestly, journalists are kind of at the mercy of all of these platforms. And so, um, so many places like Mike is a good example, right? You know, they pivoted entirely to video because Facebook said they would pay them to do that. And then the Facebook was like, yeah, no, nah, not really. I'm not in that. And they shut down basically. So, um, so this is a real challenge for the whole industry is to be at the best of, of, a, of a machine that is not accountable to, so there's an accountability issue within. Back to the question about broader forms of inclusion. Really close to the mic though. Back to, back to the question of broader forms of inclusion. I think it's on all of us and at different levels, right? So um, I'm not trying to skirt this, but I'm trying to say like that this is going to have to be a networked response to a network challenge. and. Uh, one of the reasons why I keep coming back to the, like the frame of governance as the as the puzzle here is that we do not know how to govern at that kind of scale with that at a networked level. We don't know how to think about ethics across networks. We, there's so many opening challenges. Um, and that's where there's no doubt that we need to be finding ways where the thinking is happening in all these different directions. Now, the question is often for me, what is the right structure to make that work? So obviously in the United States, we live under a, 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 a history um, of an 18th century imagination of governance through a representative democracy. That isn't scaling well, isn't managing diverse kinds of populations well. So it's not just that the governance with regard to these tech systems is at play. We are having a broader set of challenges around governance for this is which this is one of it. And so that's, you know, in terms of, in, you know, the, the, the real practical, you know, certainly from a university place, there is a, you know, a responsibility to think about whose voices are, are, are being educated and all of this. Certainly from a, um, uh, you know, a civil society or corporate place, it's really about how do you build the right connective tissue? How do you think about you know, diversity, equity, and inclusion in every hiring and decision making and choice of where you invest in? Those are all really important, but I would argue that even those initiatives are only the tip of the broader iceberg to get to this question. And so, you know, one of the big openings here is how are we going to do that in a resource constrained ecosystem? Shall we move on? Another, no. Uh, I, uh, yeah, about um, including more diverse voices and I love hearing all the additional ideas again because I don't think there's one way of, of doing this, but a few of the things we've tried are across the spectrum, essentially, of kind of the quantitative to qualitative ways of listening to voices. So on um, the extreme end of quantitative is every single week we get millions of pieces of user feedback. So listening to that and trying to understand how are our products affecting people and how could our products be better. However, there's a difference between the type of people who submit that type of feedback and who's representative of our user base. And that, that gets to who, who believes they can and should be contributing to the conversation. And that gets to kind of structural inequalities that through our, our user research, and I was a user researcher before uh, moving into responsible innovation, that when we conduct research, there are some people who, because of cultural pressures or, or societal uh, and historical inequalities don't believe they can ask for more from big companies like us. That why would a big company like Google listen to them? That there's no way that their voices is, is going to be heard through the noise. So how do we get those people? And we kind of move from that push approach, which is here's our feedback channels, go use it and we'll listen to you to a more pull approach. Going to where people are, going to community leaders and community groups and asking them how to uh, understand people's experience. One uh, research um, study that we were doing that comes to mind is when 
we were doing some research on um, fairness in, in our image search results and hosting these uh, community engagements and participatory workshops, we broke people into the groups who are directly affected by potential exclusion um, from our products and their allies and community leaders. And the people who are directly affected were who we saw didn't say, you should change, you should insert uh, algorithm. They're like, that's just the way the algorithm is. And so even some of our users are, are like giving us an out by blaming an algorithm. But the allies and the community leaders were like, you have to change, you have to make these changes. Here's how you listen to my community. And it was very noticeable, the difference. So for us, listening to diverse voices is going where our, our users are, but also understanding how do we get the information from them, not just overwhelming people with you could do this, it's actually going there and asking it in a way that's useful. Another example that comes to mind is, is in India, our user researchers go into houses with pen and paper without relying on who's accessing our feedback tools again, who's accessing our technology, going in the way and speaking to people um, in their homes where they are in a way that they that is less intimidating than Google, a big company, is coming and making me kind of speak up and I don't feel heard. So just m different ways, not one single solution again, um, and would love to continue to hear those things. And also why we attend these events is to have people check on us and say, but you should be doing X. You're doing Y over here, but you have to be doing X um, and continuing to be open to hear those different ways of doing it. Um, Julia, you had something? Yeah, I just feel like if you're going to raise the image search issue, I feel like incumbent upon me <laughs> to say a little bit about um, Google's image search issues. So as you probably all remember years ago, um, there was this problem where Google had this facial recognition algorithm and it was autumn, it tagged some black faces as gorillas. And there was a challenge because it was like, well, why did the algorithm do this? And there's been a debate and I don't know whether it's settled inside Google what, what the issue was, but m largely my understanding is this has to do with the way the algorithm was trained and what type of data it was trained on. And I have to say, like, um, sure, it's really nice to go out and do user groups after you've released the product. But like when I grew up, I grew up in Palo Alto in Silicon Valley. I learned to code in fifth grade. And my parents were both in the software industry way back in the old days. And actually, they had quality assurance labs. And I would go, they would, whatever software they were working on, I would have to go on the weekend and test it. Like, could this nine-year-old break the software? Because when you sold software for $60 in a shrink wrap box at Fry's, it actually had to work, and there was not going to be an update released for another two years when they sent the next version out. And the truth is that Silicon Valley doesn't do anywhere near the amount of quality control. Um, they really test on the users as they release, right? Google Gmail was a beta for what, six, eight, nine years, for, right? And so the idea is that like the testing happens in the wild, and that's unfortunate, right? The harm happens right away. And so I guess I would just say that there's, um, it occurs to me, and I don't know what this team looked like, but let's say if um, the team that put out that facial recognition tagging, like, did it have diverse people on it, right? Like, because maybe they would have noticed. And so there is, I, I would just say, like, it's incumbent on Google to take some of this on themselves as well. <laughs> Yeah, no, for sure. And definitely a uh, horrible, horrible uh, incident that shouldn't have happened. But it also was a very strong learning of like, did we have the right people in the room? How do we make sure next time we do have the right people in the room? And are we doing those tests before launch, not just after? But also with the caveat that we won't catch everything. And certainly something like that should not happen again. But something similar in a different product may happen again. So it, again, it goes back to accountability. Uh, we have to do more ourselves, but we also can't do it alone. And so what are those uh, regulations, like feedback channels that of the things that unintentionally happen or slip through, yes, we have to react as quickly as possible, but those instances should be reduced over time as we learn more of what we need to be doing before that. So co like completely agree with all those points and must get better internally as well, for sure. Right. And you don't have to go all the way to nationalization to get, hey, there should be audits before pre before something is released, like the way there's an environmental impact audit, should there be a disparate impact audit for uh, products before they're released? Like that would be a very light, lighter, much lighter touch regulatory move than nationalization and feels like maybe we have the evidence to support something like that. I mean, I'll just say uh, before we move on, the question was originally to the escape center. It was um, how will the escape center make more voices heard and include more people? Um, Sylvia is actually going to talk briefly about that at 445. But just as a prelude, I'll answer and say that 
as you may have seen on the website, we made an explicit decision to form a research center that had a cooperative structure with a grassroots mission. And what that means is that there are a series of events starting uh, with this event, this event um, where we're going to ask you to participate with us and think about our next steps. And I, I don't know that no one's ever done that before. It's that novel, but I, I would say it's somewhat novel. Like there aren't, you know, when there's a new academic department, I don't often think of that as the structure. It's everyone should come in. And we're, we're definitely interested in that. Um, even the minor things like the, um, certainly it would be worth doing the streaming uh, just for convenience and it's, it's a, a way uh, to help people with disabilities be sure they can participate in the event. But at the same time, um, we wanna get the extra special camera that costs extra money to be sure that we're not all blurry blobs and to try and actually stream it in real time and to take questions from outside the University of Michigan to anyone on the internet. And in our tests, we were able to bring people in from other constituencies that weren't here in Michigan. So we're, we're very excited about that, but I'll leave the rest of the answer there to, to Sylvia at 4.45. Um, so there's a number of threads in the questions, um, and they're duplicated. So, uh, and, and there's also more than we're gonna be able to get through. So it's difficult to make a choice. I mean, I think one thing that I'll put out there, um, there's a number of questions on the table right now that seem to have a structure about what about, what can I do? Like, what is it that I can do? And, and I think some of the questioners, maybe I'm reading in, but there's a, a feeling of um, powerlessness about some of these technologies where it seems like uh, we're talking at a very high level. Um, you know, these are very abstract conversations. So what, what actually can I do? So some of the questions are about specific things on specific platforms, but I think generally there's a bigger question here, which is um, how can we get people excited about this topic and, and want to come in and work with us on it? And, and to do something useful about it. And, I, and so does anyone want to take that on? Um, I would say I do hear this a lot about technology as a person who writes a lot about problems in technology. People always come to me and say, you're just making me feel hopeless. There's nothing I can do. Why are you doing this to me, Julia? And, um, and I try to apologize. But I do think that um, we, have some, we have some agency and more agency than we think. Um, I like to think of it as like we're moving a little bit towards like the farmer's market model, like know your farmer and then your food, you know, you like the food. With technology, we can be a little bit art more artisanal about our choices of what we use, right? Some tools are unavoidable. I've tried to use other things than Google Maps. I've found most of them unsatisfactory. But I use DuckDuckGo for search because I want to use a search engine that doesn't collect any personal information about me and doesn't personalize my results in any way, doesn't make an assumption about what I am or whether I'm a criminal and may have arrest records. Um, and so I do think that we can make different choices. I use different tools so that I won't have ads tracking me. So I do think it's hard to do ad blockers because a lot of journalists, that's the only revenue they have, but I try to block sort of the tracking of ads, which is difficult to do without blocking ads, um, but is something you can attempt to do. And there are ways you can ch be thoughtful about what kind of tools you use. One thing we, we use in the office is we use an encrypted chat service called Wire instead of Slack, because Slack doesn't have um, a deletion policy that works for us. They don't have a block button. They don't have a lot of features that are good for communities. And they don't, aren't encrypted. And we, we only use tools that are encrypted. So there are ways that you, as a user, can vote with your feet, because the, custom, the companies are responsive to um, to their users and they want to satisfy them. That's why you see all the different tech companies moving more towards privacy protecting services, which is a great um, ch change. Building on that, I think that those, w those of us who have more privilege and more ability to make the choices that Julia have articulated also have a responsibility to push back on how these things are used in context that for amongst populations who have less access. So this is one of the things where you, know, you can even talk within the local government level. Why is your local government doing what it's doing? Why is your taxpayer money paying what it's paying? How do you make a stink about that? Um, and that's why I see a, like, a lot of times we focus really on big companies, but we don't focus on the fact that you know, in the local um, uh, you know, incarceration facility that you have to uh, that people who are uh, incarcerated have to pay, you know, three dollars uh, a minute in order to talk to their family via video con. That is unacceptable, and that's something where I believe that there's a lot of opportunity and room to push back. I also think on that level, at the more sort of everyday, it's about thinking about how your choices online and in these environments have ripple effects. And if you want to go with a real simple 
what are the consequences to your children when you're posting pictures of them online? Or what are the consequences of you know, the decisions of what it means to take a picture in public and throw it on Instagram in a facial recognition ecosystem? So there's, part of it is to take the agency at all these different levels, um, but uh, really to you know, it also really check your own um, ability to actually make uh, pr add pressure to the systemic issues. You're, you're going to break the model here? OK. Andre wants to not use the app, but that's cool. I did. I, I know, but yet I'm, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get to your question. We've got 15 minutes left. You, go for it. Go for it. Mic. Yeah, I think you, you need a mic, yeah. Just briefly. Um, Julia and, and uh, Dana, I really respect the perspectives that you bring, but I have to ask, your uh, answers just now really seem to reflect an individualized view of technology use. And for many folk, the technologies that they use are infrastructural. Uh, even if we're talking about social media apps, there are certain apps that are used as communication in place of the, the deprecation of longstanding communication infrastructures. So, you know, I'm specifically thinking telephones, right? Public telephones access, but there are other things as well. Uh, and so how do you... The question was, what can individuals do? I know, but I, okay, but you, you so brought up... So why don't you answer it? <laughs> you brought up the so idea that people have, um, people have less access to these things. And my, my question kind of sort of is, what if that less access is by design? Right, and then how do they? How do these individuals then make the accommodations that you're asking people to do, where they deliberately give up products or do the minimalist thing, or you know the the technology um, vacations that people are doing? How do you, how how could we, as a center, then try to recognize the infrastructural nature of communication and how people can uh, work through that individually? I mean, and I got to an answer. That's my next panel, though. I mean, just. Uh... <laughs> I think the, the fascinating thing about this for me is that I used to, earlier in my career, if people asked me what my area of research was, I would sometimes say information policy or public policy. And lately, I don't say that as much anymore. And one reason that I don't is that if someone, I guess in the earlier version of me, if someone asked me how can individuals get involved, public policy would be part of my answer. I would say something about democratic organizing, I believe in democracy, That's, that would be my answer. And I think it's not an individualist answer to this question of how can someone change something. But I have to say, lately I'm very depressed about that avenue, being in the United States, and I struggle with that. And I'm not sure, uh, I, I also see less enthusiasm from students about that avenue. So I say, you know, hey, get involved, uh, let's pass a law, and they're like, what? what with, with this Congress, or you know, I mean, it, it's it's uh, so um, so uh, yeah. That was a non-answer, but that's uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, well, we have uh, again a number of great. We're not going to make it uh, through the themes that we have, but let's see if we can hit another. I want to do one as a vote, just so we can get it on the table because it's a good one. Um, can I ask the panel how many of you believe that tech companies are more powerful than world leaders? So this is a question from the audience. How many people think that tech companies are more? Does anyone want to raise their hand for that? Are tech companies more powerful? We can do the audience. Yeah, that's a great idea. Raise your hand if you think that tech but, companies are more powerful. But Christian, than we this is unfair. And the reason why is like, who? I mean, this this is a question of like, which tech companies, which world leaders is the first part of it. I mean, we're in an academic facility, but the other the other is, at what level, right? Mm -hmm. So like, you know. And also, how do we deal with the fact that they're imbricated into each other? So it's like, at the end of the day, it's the state that is going to incarcerate, but using technologies as part of its augmented structure. So like this, if, if we were in any environment about an academic one, I would, like, I would be willing to play nice. Uh -huh. But come on, <laughs> take the STS response to that. Uh -huh. I mean, so I think my um, my motive was to to try and get through the many ideas here, even if raising them briefly uh, might be better than not raising them at all. I mean, another uh, another point that I wanted to get to before we're out of time was actually a question from Andre, who identified himself in the online um, forum as well, and that's what is the role of the university uh, in the the ecosystem that we're talking about. This is a, an academic center, a university center. So what is the role of the university in ethics, society, and computing? Um, I think that I take that question to be partly about our hopes. Like, what can the university do that perhaps we're positioned in a way that other institutions can't do it, but also just how do they connect? It could be a factual connection. We've been talking about um, companies. So what, what is the university supposed to do? I mean, I feel like
You can have mine. Or yeah, there's an extra one. Yeah. Um, yes, I was just saying, I mean, I think the real unique benefit of the university is its ability to undertake long-term, sustained, deep research. And I think when we think about the challenges that exist in terms of understanding history, the history of these things and the harms and the need to do broader contextualization of stuff, I think there's certainly an intellectual project that can't be overlooked. And then beyond that, the kind of convening and organizing piece uh, can be strong. Role of the university. So the university, of course, has these different kinds of responsibilities and roles within this. One is its educational mandate, which we should take really seriously and say, how do you open uh, the ability to educate people in the best ways possible for the environment that we are in? And that means thinking about the university beyond its just walls, but thinking it more in a more sophisticated way. And that, of course, for your center, that's a part of it, but really that question of education that has turned into a very basic way of operating it's to be upended in light of this. So we can think about how to empower and inform as many people so that they can consume other things in ways that make sense. And it also means about righting wrongs, about long-standing inequities with regard to who had access to knowledge and information and the networks that are associated with uh, the project of education. There is, of course, a research component to it, which, you know, in the university, we've we've tethered in funny ways, and part of it is is that we need to think about the research component of it, of what it means to do it at a larger and more networked and strategic way. I think a lot, you know, I've been talking to a lot of people in, you know, old national labs structures about what it meant to come together at different points in history um, in the 20th century to deal with different kinds of knowledge production that was necessary, that could not just take one way of seeing and one way of knowing in order to get there. And that, of course, was done for a militaristic process. But if we take seriously that the societal impacts of this are so huge that we need to actually come together, how do we build the right kinds of structures and knit together the networks where the knowledge from a sum of research can be greater than the individual parts. Then there is the institution um, as a landowner, endowment possessor, um, you know, employer, et cetera, that I think is really important to think about what its a role in, in laying out the ethics of the future should be. Um, you know, and obviously we're at a public institution which is a different uh, kind of environment than somebody who's got an endowment larger than you know, most nation states. Um, so, but that moment of really being a, a question of how much are you upholding the structures as they have existed and as they continue to oppress, or how much can you leverage the institution to actually start um, you know, redressing a lot of those structural inequities. So I think of it in all of those parts that I think is really important. Um, and I think that this is going to be the time, in part because the university and the production of knowledge that we take for granted in the university is going to be seriously at threat over the next 20 years. Well, there's a few reactions from the, the crowd here that I think are fantastic. I know we're going back one question, but the previous question about raise your hand uh, if you think that tech companies are more powerful than world leaders, um, someone pointed out that for the people looking through the stream, they may not have known that a large number of people in the audience did raise their hand almost immediately. Um, I don't know if it was half, but it was a large number of people, um, so the people on the stream didn't get a chance to see that. And that fact in itself, says the questioner, is remarkable. It's interesting that that you know, is, is the way that people are thinking about the, the tech sector. Um, we also have a great point. Uh, it, we have made a panel of white people talking about race. Here we are, white people talking about race, and that's a problem, um, and it sucks. I'm, I'm sorry, um, and I'm not, going to, I'm not going to continue to apologize, but I wanted to raise the fact that that's a problem, and we're going to work on it. Um, uh, the, the, there, again, I'm, you guys have such great questions. I'm thinking, ah, oh, five minutes left. Which way am I going to go with this? Um, I think one other way that uh, we could go that I'd like to, to get on the table before we... Um, uh, <laughs> some of the questioners are very funny. I'm sorry. <clears throat> uh, okay, so um, I think we could... Uh, so there, there's a large number of questions um, about um, Google. So we'll go back to Google. Um, I think the questions that we have for Google on here, it's hard to summarize them all, but uh, one thread that people are definitely interested in is that they feel that there is no way um, 
to not be monitored and controlled and affected by Google in a way that they don't like. Uh, and I think we could, in addition, put other companies and institutions in here in place of Google in this conversation. Maybe the NSA. I don't know. Um, so, uh, so is there anything that we can do about that? Again, it's a, it's phrased in an individual sense. But do you have anything that we want to contribute to this in our uh, remaining four minutes? Well, I'd I'd like to hear other panelists' uh, response as well about what we should be thinking about. But yes, there are ways to control your experience online at Google. Um, in your account settings, you can choose uh, which uh, to see what data is collected on you and remove it completely. We have the um, the uh, a way to see where your data is used and then choose to export that for your for yourself as well and i believe facebook had also um, launched a similar uh, tool as well we also allow for ad settings for people who don't want to have assumptions made about who they are what ads they want to see and um, in the why this ad on, on every ad you can click on that and go into your ad settings and remove what ads are shown to you remove how you're tracked online um, and to to have that control over uh, over ads so there's account level settings, there's ad specific settings, um, and then um, there's also a safe search for searching online without it being tracked and making assumptions again of where you are. So different products have their own depth of control, but account settings is the across our products that gives you more control. But would love, as I say to hear additional ideas, what else uh, to be thinking of. Um, but there are a couple of things that come to mind. Yeah, I saw the one about how to... Um, to, uh, I don't see it up there now, um, about the ad settings uh, tracking one. So to search on our ad settings, and that will give you some I mean, more just, just to circle back, though, I mean, the earlier point raised by Andre about infrastructures, I mean, I think the, there's another way to take that question, and it is that modern life seems to insert you into a system where all kinds of technologies are something that you don't have much choice about. Um, so, uh, I mean, that's the way I would take that question. In addition, um, does anyone want to respond there? I mean, yeah, most, uh, like, there's, every once in a while, there's a privacy survey that happens, like, a, in academia, where they look at, you know, top million websites or whatever, and usually um, there's Google sort of tracking technology on, you know, 90% of sites, so even if you change your ad settings, like, Google Analytics is on almost every page in, that you visit on the internet, and um, Google has now started combining that with other data they used to wall it off. Um, we at the Markup are building an alternative to Google Analytics because we want to assure our readers that they will not be tracked. So they will not. We actually have to build our own, which is insane, obviously. <laughs> um, and uh, we are not going to have any sort of tracking at all, third-party tracking on our site, which is really difficult. So we're trying to build, like outside of, uh, it changes the way that you interact with everything and it makes our job so much harder. And it's a real, in some ways, it's a demonstration project of how difficult it is to escape from the infrastructure of the internet that really is an entirely commercial infrastructure, right? There is not a public um, piece of it so much anymore. And so everything is part of a commercial transaction. When you go somewhere, your data is being taken. And it's, um, it's, so it's really, really difficult to extract yourself, and I think people are right to feel um, stressed out about that. I mean, I, I think we, Jen and I would have to go through a debate about like how, what does it really mean to take your stuff out of that settings? It doesn't always mean everything is gone. And, but ultimately, um, that's a choice we've made as a society to allow for an entirely commercial uh, infrastructure. I should note, um, as a questioner did, that the University of Michigan requires all students and faculty and staff to use Google. Uh, any other takers on this uh, this point? The infrastructure, the. I mean, the one thing I would just say. Can I add? And then I'll sorry. I have 60, it's, 60 seconds. Okay, I just want to say because I think it's um, amazing. So the it's not just the front end of what you see on the internet, but also the back end. The cloud is really basically Google and Amazon. And and what's weird is the internet was built to withstand war, right? And so the idea was this decentralized network that would not go down if any node was taken out. But weirdly, we've managed to centralize that back end. And so I, the joke that I like to make these days is that it was designed to withstand war, but it will not withstand capitalism. Because when one section of the cloud that goes out, which happened, I think, most recently with Google, um, like the whole Midwest came, went down for uh, you know afternoon. So I think the the infrastructure conversation goes far beyond these particular players. Where we're on the individual, I. I've been I've spending a lot of time within um, uh, federal agencies lately, and 
you know, it dawned on me this week that um, the conversation about, you know, smaller government, which of course has become a political talking point, means that, you know, the, one of the agencies I'm spending time with is over 50% contractors from every consulting organization. And so you have this ecosystem where it's like, even things that you think of as public infrastructure are no longer public, public infrastructure. They have been privatized in all sorts of ways. That includes our military, that includes different kinds of government um, structures. And that's one of the reasons why, what it means to opt out of the data tracking is what it means to opt out of this version of you know economic considerations that we've created and that's what i find so intimidating and terrifying and i'm with julia that you know these mo these little acts of resistance are delightful they're joyous you can build you know all sorts of fun things but they're also not what we that we can't assume that the world is artisanal not everybody can afford that nine dollar bread um but you know, how do we then deal with the fact that we've built so many infrastructures that are even invisible to us? And I think that it's notable that, of course, we're talking about household names and household companies. But much of that infrastructure, like any form of infrastructure, is made up of organizations and names and people that you have never heard of. And they get involved in these processes. I remember at one point I went to interview. Remember that we're out of we're time. Out of time. Um, <laughs> I'll keep this short, but you know, I started interviewing some um, some tech engineers at one of these companies that I found to be especially insidious, and tried to figure out why they did this work that we could unquestionably say was unethical. And the only thing I found in common, all of them were on precarious visas. Right, so this is also where, how do we look at this as a systems level problem, and that's what, I think is perfect for the Escape Center to start thinking about this as a systems level issue. And I'm really excited to be able to be a part of that launch and invite you to start thinking about this holistically and to constantly complicate and challenge our current ways of thinking. That's a great place to stop. Please join me in thanking our panel. I found it to be a provocative and interesting panel, and I learned from it. I hope that you did as well. We're going to reconvene uh, at 3.15 for the second panel. If you'd like to get ready for the Q&A for that panel, it's at a different URL, so be sure you go to the URL for the second Q&A, and that's because we're saving all your questions and thinking about them.